but I can tell you that much right Order. now. Order. Senator Lambie, you'll be in continuation. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yesterday, the News Limited papers reported that, and I quote, Scott Morrison is considering slashing the $1,500 JobKeeper payment or phasing it out faster than expected. So I asked the minister, is the government contemplating the withdrawal of any job seeker support to Australians prior to the current September end date? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. No. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Government ministers and Liberal MPs and senators are reported to be actively debating ways to phase out COVID-19 support to Australians in need. New South Wales Liberal MP Mr. Jason Falinski told media today, and I quote, "I think we should turn off JobKeeper as soon as possible. As soon as the schools are back, then it should go." Does the Prime Minister agree with his backbencher? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Firstly, on uh, our side of the parliament, on the uh, Liberal National uh, side of the parliament, uh, individual members of parliament are entitled to express their views on policy issues, and we think it's a very important part of the democratic debate, and it helps ensure that we get uh, better outcomes uh, going through proper process. Now, in relation, in relation to the JobKeeper program, uh, the government's position is, as it always has been, it is a substantial program, uh, providing support as we speak to more than 5.5 million working Australians, helping to keep them connected uh, to, their, to their employers. And, and that, is a, that has been a very good thing and it's been extremely well received uh, by people right around Australia. We've always said that there would be a review at the midpoint uh, and Treasury uh, will be conducting that review and reporting that review uh, in, uh, in, in June. Uh, but it is a, it, we're six weeks in to a six-month program and we're committed to the program uh, for six months. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Final supplementary. Does the Prime Minister share Mr Flinsky's view that we should turn JobKeeper off as soon as possible? Just, after, just one week after JobKeeper finally started flowing, will the Prime Minister cave to backbench demands to snap back at the expense of the continued support the economy and Australian workers need? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The first point I would make is that it was our government our government that has put in place the support that the economy, uh, business and working Australians need. Our government. Our government. Now, what I would also what I would also what I would what I would also what I would also say is that of course uh, the, the uh, member uh, uh, for McKellar uh, is of course right when he says that we want people to get back into uh, their jobs and working for profitable businesses as soon as possible. Of course, that's, of course that's what we want. Of course we want to ensure that businesses can be back in business in a profitable fashion and can be back uh, employing Australians, investing in their future success, hiring more Australians, paying them better wages over time. Of course that's what we want to see as soon as possible. In relation to the JobKeeper program, the government's position is clear. Uh, we are six weeks in to a six-month program. There will be a review uh, mid uh, Y, and that is, that is as we've that is as we've uh, announced it at the outset, and that is what we will stick to. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on the Morrison government's response to the coronavirus pandemic and the progress Australia is making to protect lives? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Askew for the, the question. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would also like to acknowledge, given that it is International Nurses Day today, uh, the outstanding and tireless work of Australia's nurses, uh, in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. President, as the Prime Minister has said, we are fighting a war on two fronts in trying to protect both the health of Australians and our economy from COVID-19. Australians, though, have commenced the road back following the National Cabinet's decision last week to endorse the National Roadmap for COVID-19 recovery. And what we've seen since that time is state and territory governments respond and provide Australians with the vision for the road back, both in terms of their health and the economy. In terms of the work of the containment of COVID-19, we still have a long way to go. But our testing has now seen 861,000 tests across Australia. The rate of positive returns has now dropped to below 1 per cent 
across those 861,000 tests. Encouragingly, as we're doing more tests, we are returning a lower percentage of people who are positive across the country. We've now had less than half a per cent per day increase for over two weeks, and for that Australians should be congratulated. That is an extraordinary milestone and one which even six or eight weeks ago would have appeared impossible. We are now seeing downward pressure on those numbers across the country, and that is only because of the hard work of Australians and on behalf of the Minister for Health and the government, I acknowledge the hard work of all Australians in achieving those numbers. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise how Australia's response compares internationally? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and yes, I can. Our job as a government has been very, very clear, and that is to stand up for and to protect Australia's interests, in particular the health and safety of Australians. We have had particularly, when you look at, in an international context, significant success in managing and containing the outbreak of COVID-19 here in Australia. We have one of the highest testing rates in the world and one of the lowest mortality rates in the world. We've seen the growth in the number of COVID-19 cases go from more than 20 per cent per day just a few weeks ago to less than half a per cent today. Adjusting for population, the death poll in the UK is over 110 times that of Australia, France 100 times and the United States it is over 50 times. Again, this is due to the response of the Australian Order, people. Senator Cash. Senator Askew, a final supplementary question. Minister, what are the government's key health priorities to manage risk as Australia begins to ease restrictions? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And in the first instance, as a country, um, we have now seen in excess of 5.8 million Australians uh, download and register for the COVID Safe app. Mr President, now more than anything, as we commence that road to recovery, uh, we encourage even more Australians to download the COVID Safe app. This is an important public health initiative that will keep Australians safe from the further spread of COVID-19 through early notification of possible exposure. Mr President, we've also seen a three-step roadmap adopted by all states and territories. And we now have the capacity to meet all of the foreseeable scenarios in Australia. And again, I congratulate Australians for the hard work that they have undertaken. Through the steps that they have taken, we have managed to flatten the curve through our containment measures, and we have also been able to adopt— Order. Senator Cash. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. ABS data released earlier this month showed that up to 700,000 people had lost their jobs since mid-March due to COVID-19. The RBA is predicting that unemployment will reach 10 per cent by the middle of the year uh, and remaining persistently high for years to come. Does the government agree with the RBA's assessment? And in what year will unemployment return to pre-coronavirus levels? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, the, the first point I would make is that, yes, we are going through a challenging period as a result of a very serious external health shock. Uh, the uh, measures that we've had to take in order to save lives uh, and protect people's health uh, have uh, required us to make decisions which have had a, a very uh, negative devastating effect on the economy. We are sort of now uh, coming out uh, somewhat on the other side, uh, which is why we've been able to see some of the uh, early uh, phases of the easing of restrictions taking place uh, around, around Australia. But, I mean, you know, this is, this is an incredibly challenging period. Australia is in a better position uh, than many other countries around the world. We are winning the fight against the virus, but uh, there is still a lot of risk. Um, in the um, Shadow Minister for Finance asked me about uh, our uh, um, expectations in terms of the unemployment rate. Well, the, the Treasurer and Treasury already uh, announced some time ago that the expectation was for unemployment to uh, reach 10 per cent. 
uh, in during the uh, June uh, quarter. If it hadn't been for our measures, the expectation would have been that that would have been 15 percent. And if you look at, again, on the economic front at some of the other countries around the world, uh, you will see uh, unemployment rates of 15 percent and higher. Uh, in many uh, economies around the world that have also had to deal with this challenge. We are not making uh, firm uh, forecasts now. Uh, we've shifted the budget to October for a reason, and that is because uh, there is too much uncertainty uh, in, uh, the, in terms of the economic context to make credible uh, forecasts uh, now. We will be providing a further update in an economic statement uh, in June. That is uh, you know, what we have uh, publicly announced. And in that economic statement, which comes after the March quarter national accounts have been released in early June, uh, we will be providing uh, further assessments of our expectations on uh, economic parameters like the ones uh, Senator Gallagher has, uh, has referenced. Order, but it Senator would be premature Norman. to say more than we have now. The answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a Thank you, Mr. Question. President. Deloitte has also projected that unemployment levels will remain at heightened levels for years to come, predicting it won't reach its pre-COVID-19 level until at least 2024. However, on 13 March, the Treasurer said, and I quote, the Prime Minister was very strong on how there would be a snapback. They were his words. The economy would snap back. Does the Prime Minister stand by his snap back claim? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Of course, we want to see a strong economic recovery on the other side of this crisis. I mean, that is, uh, is self evident. That is self evident that that's what we want to see. And let me say, any Australian who uh, is watching what has happened in other uh, economies around the world and compares that with what is happening here in Australia would say that both on a health front and on an economic front, that Australia is performing comparatively better. That doesn't mean that we're not uh, facing continued challenges. Of course we are. And of course there's going to be much uh, hard work that will need to be done. But let me tell you, uh, our uh, agenda of uh, lower taxes, a smaller government, uh, encouraging and incentivizing uh, uh, hard work, effort, uh, risk taking, I mean these are the sorts of uh, policy values and principles that will that will stand Australia in very good stead, that will help us to ensure that Australians will have the best possible opportunity to get ahead in the future. We need a, we need a strong private sector-led recovery. We need to ensure that the nine out of ten working Australians who work for private sector businesses uh, have the Order. best possible Senator Cormann, job opportunity the answer the has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, don't Australians deserve better than a post-crisis snapback to an economy in which workers worry about job insecurity and where job seekers are relegated to poverty? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I completely reject the premise of that question. I completely reject the premise of the question. At the, at the, well, I reject the premise of uh, your description of the way the economy was. Let me just remind, uh, let me remind the Honourable Senator that the last election was actually, was actually a referendum on two competing uh, economic plans. Your plan for higher taxes, your anti-business, anti-business, high taxing, socialist, anti-aspiration agenda, and our pro-opportunity lower taxes, a pro-growth, pro-business agenda, which Australians judged was a better way to ensure that, they and, uh, that Australians today into the future had the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, we, we, will, we will do what we have done in the past. We will pursue a pro-growth, pro-opportunity agenda, which will ensure that all Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. Uh, and, and that is, of course, the basis on which, under our leadership, 1.5 million new jobs were created in the economy uh, in the period prior to this COVID crisis hitting us. Order, Senator Cormann. Time jobs. for the answer has expired. Senator Seward. President, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Today, the Minister for Finance referred in his speech to ensuring a safety net which is underpinned by a sense of decency and fairness. Does the government think that living on $40 a day is decent and fair? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Seward, for your question. Um, one of the things that um, we do need to make very clear here, Senator Seward, is that the, um, the $40 a day to which you um, constantly refer is the primary payment for JobSeeker. Um, and, uh, and that is, it is but the primary payment. And almost nobody in Australia who is on a JobSeeker payment only receives the primary payment. Um, I draw to your attention a number of supplementary payments uh, to make sure 
that our social security system is targeted and to make sure that when people need a little bit of extra support, we actually target that support to those people who need it. For example, uh, obviously people who have children are going to require additional support. So through Family Tax Benefit Part A and Part B, we are able to target uh, additional support to those people. Uh, people who are find themselves in a situation where they're renting. We are able to target our rental assistance to those people. Uh, in addition, there are a number of other payments, which could be energy supplement, the utility allowance, the telephone allowance, carers allowance. The list goes on, Senator Seward. So to say that you're referring to $40 a day is not an accurate reflection to the targeted social welfare system that we have put in place to help Australians when they're down and when they're out of job. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Through you, Mr. President. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said. If people are in jobs, they don't need income support. Does the government think by the end of September that the potentially 1.4 million people who are still unemployed will have found work? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Senator Seward. Obviously, the number one priority of this government over recent weeks has been to make sure that we keep Australians safe from the corona pandemic. We have worked tremendously hard on our health response, and I think everybody in this chamber would have to agree that Australia has done phenomenally well in dealing with our health crisis. But we have a second responsibility, and that is to make sure that we kickstart our economy. And the road to our recovery is going to be built on the back of business because it's businesses that create jobs. And as Senator Cormann has just said, you nine out of ten jobs in Australia are with the private sector. And so we are going to work very hard to make sure that we are able to stimulate the Australian economy within a COVID-safe environment to make. Senator Seward, on a point of order. Of order, I asked a very specific question in terms of does the government think those 1.4 million people will have found a job? Um, you had a quote from the Prime Minister and that was a summary of the question you asked. I am listening to the Minister. I have let you remind, remind the Minister of the question. I think the Minister can be directly relevant by speaking to the government's objectives in that matter, but I will listen carefully for the last 15 seconds. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know whether you do have, have one too, Senator Siebert, but what I can tell you is that this government will work tirelessly day and night and between now and whenever we are past this pandemic to make sure that every Australian who needs Order, a job Senator is going Rustin. to be Rustin. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Through you to the minister. Can I ask, is the government going to drop the job seeker payment back to $40 a day? After the 25th of September this year, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Senator Seward. The the the, uh, the government has been very clear. Uh, that the measures that we've put in place, and there are a number of measures, including the corona supplement that you refer to, uh, that have been put in place to help Australians to be able to get to the other side of this crisis. But we have always said they would be targeted. We have always said that they will be temporary. Um, and we will continue to work with the Australian um, people and through uh, the economic stimulation that we need to put in place to make sure that we, on the other side of this crisis, are able to get Australians back to work. But we have been very, very clear uh, about the supports that we've put in place, a whole range of them, ranging from the $750 twice um, economic supplement that we have given to, uh, to people on pensions, the corona supplement, whether it's been um, reducing eligibility um, requirements for people getting onto payment, whether it's been the removal of the asset test. All of these things have been put in place to help Australians to get to the other side of this corona pandemic. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, as Chair of the Australia and New Zealand Forum on Food Regulation. Minister, I refer you to your recent letter to me regarding the Forum's decision to ask FSANS to revise its proposal for mandatory pregnancy warning labels on packaged alcohol. In your letter, you claim FSANS' proposal places an unreasonable cost burden on the alcohol industry. FSAN's cost-benefit analysis says each new case of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder costs at least $13,847 a year in health and disability costs alone, which equates to a projected annual cost of over $3 million each and every year for new cases. Yet the one-off cost to industry is just $4,924 per product. Minister, are lives or alcohol industry profits more important to government? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank uh, Senator for his question, Mr. President. The decision 
that I wrote to you about uh, in response to your correspondence was a decision made by ministers of all states, territories and the New Zealand government with respect to the report provided to food ministers uh, into the um, labelling of alcohol and, and pregnancy warning labels. Uh, it was considered by all of those ministers and a majority of states, territories uh, at that forum voted to, to review the uh, recommendations that have been put forward. I might add, Mr. President, that, the, that all governments sitting around the table are committed to um, alcohol warning labels on uh, compulsory alcohol warning labels on on um, alcohol receptacles. Uh, that decision will be made uh, very soon. We've asked for for Zance to come back to the committee with a report uh, within 12 me weeks of the last meeting, which is, I think, from recollection, sometime in June. Senator Grip, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, your letter also mentioned that FSANS is being asked to review the colour of the warning label, and FSANS elected to use red because, and I'll quote, evidence indicates red increases the speed of identification and level of attention the warning receives. Minister, why does the government or the respective state governments have an issue with using red on a warning label given FSAN's evidence based reasons for using it? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, the evidence presented in FSAN's report also talked about the importance of contrast on labels. Uh, and in some circumstances, red, quite frankly, just isn't practical. Um, the point that uh, Senator made in his primary question with respect to cost was one of the considerations that was a part of that process as well. Uh, but I can say quite categorically uh, the importance of pregnancy warning labels is such that it needs to be visible on a label, and in that context contrast is important. Uh, and a red symbol on a red label simply won't work. So one of the concerns that we had was that uh, there was appropriate contrast of the label, uh, of the symbol on the label, uh, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, minister, food ministers asked Fazans to reconsider a, as a part of our decision-making process, uh, and as I said, the report to come back to uh, food ministers' meeting within 12 weeks of order. That Senator report. Colbeck, Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Min minister, you stated that you are committed, and everyone is committed to mandatory pregnancy warning labels. If the revised proposal that comes back within 12 weeks um, from Fazans puts forward uh, essentially the same. Um, recommendation as in the original proposal, will you accept it? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, that is in fact quite a hypothetical. Uh, we've asked for Zantz to review the report that it provided to us. We've pointed to two particular issues that we wanted for Zantz to reconsider. Uh, my conversations with them is that they are considering that work. We've asked them to report back to us to, within 12 weeks so that we can reconsider it. Uh, and, with, uh, and, and hopefully, Mr. President, we'll be in a situation whereby later in this year we have a decision to have mandatory pregnancy warning labels on alcohol receptacles uh, within a period of time. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. How many Australians are earning more than their normal wage because they are now receiving the JobKeeper wage subsidy of $1,500 per fortnight? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'll take that question on notice. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. No, we don't know. We don't know. Order. Senator Keneally. Why should a single mother working as a casual teacher for five years miss out on JobKeeper because she hasn't worked 12 months with a single school, while a university student who's been a part time worker for a lengthy period receives significantly more than their regular income. Shame on you. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. There is clearly evidence emerging of a split between Mr. Albanese oh. and Mr. Chalmers. A, a, a clear split between Mr. Albanese and Mr. Chalmers. And, and clearly, Senator Keneally, right, for the moment at least, uh, is on Mr. Albanese's. Uh, no, actually, 
Yeah, she's on Mr. Albanese's side because this is the point Mr. Albanese raised when Mr. Chalmers, the shadow treasurer, was all in favour of the way we'd framed it and saying it was better to be more to err on the more order. generous than Senator, the less generous. Senator Keneally, uh, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I think you know, Mr. President, my point of order is going to be direct relevance. The question that I asked clearly went nowhere near any of the things the minister is talking about. I would be appreciated if you could draw him back um, I, to the disparity between the single mother and the university um, student. Senator Keneally, I'll, I'll draw the minister's attention to the question you asked. Um, and Senator Cormann, I ask you to return to the question. Senator Cormann. Well, uh, clearly, uh, Senator Keneally is very sensitive about what I've just revealed uh, to the Senate chamber. And I mean, the argument that she's speaking up, and that is directly relevant to the question that she's asked, the argument that she's just speaking up uh, is the argument that Mr. Albanese pursued on Fran Kelly this morning, where he is raising precisely that question. Um, uh, directly relevant to the um, question. Um, I, I'm Senator Keneally on the point of order. Sorry, I did, that was my fault. Uh, again, direct relevance. He seems to be ignoring your ruling to draw him back to um, the matter I, in, in I, the I, question. I, he is speaking about a member in the other place, not the disparity between the teacher, the single mother teacher, and the university student. Thank you. On, on, a on a the, design flaw under his own sorry, program. Senator, Senator Cormann on the point of order. On, on the point of order. Uh, how can I not be directly relevant when I'm referencing directly the question she's asked, which is directly the same as the question raised um, by Mr. The, the, Albanese the, this morning? I'm, I'm going to listen to the minister's answer. He is asserting that the quotation or the reference he's about to point to is directly relevant. I do take senators at face value when they indicate that. I call the minister. He has 11 seconds remaining. Well, this is what Mr. Albanese said this morning, and it goes directly to the question that Senator Keneally raised. Well, I don't think there's ever been a justification for people to get more money than they were getting before. Uh, I wanted to have order, an Senator. Well, well, the question has expired. Time has expired, but I'll take the point of order, Senator Wong. Thank you. Maybe this, perhaps it might be relevant to the next answer, Mr. President. I don't think any president has ruled it in order as a to persistently simply quote the opposition. I this goes to administration. This, this goes to the administration of public monies in this minister's portfolio. Uh, and on, so, on the point of order, I, Senator Keneally's point of order, I allowed some latitude in her making it due to the first part of the minister's answer. Um, the point being, I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question, nor to address a specific term in it or an example in it, as quoted by Senator Keneally. Um, the minister must remain directly relevant. I didn't get to hear the end of that, um, but I'll ask ministers to keep in mind the need to be directly relevant, not broadly relevant, to the question asked. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister confirm that approximately one million casual workers, such as the single mother who's worked as a casual teacher for five years, are missing because they haven't been with a single employer, are missing out and remain excluded by the government's design of the JobKeeper program? Why won't the treasurer fix the government's design flaws and use his extraordinary powers to include hard-hit Australian casual workers into the program. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. We are uh, supporting long term casuals and we are relying on the definition of long term casuals in the Fair Work Act. In the Fair Work Act. And I mean, the whole objective of job keeper as opposed to job seeker is to keep, is to keep uh, workers connected to their employer. Uh, and indeed, as far as casuals are concerned, that is for casuals who have worked for the same employer. For 12 months, for 12 months, at least 12 months. Now, and we are, of course, providing support uh, to more than 5.5 million Australians. A staggering number, 5.5 million Australians through this uh, JobKeeper uh, program, and, and the number is, I believe, still rising. But, uh, but, but of course, I mean, there are other supports available. For there are other supports available, subject to their circumstances, depending on how much uh, they uh, otherwise earn and the like. But uh, there are other supports available. Uh, for, for those who find themselves out of work uh, through the job seeker program, which of course comes with all sorts of ad additional uh, benefits as well, uh, such, as, such, as, such as, of course, rental assistance Order. and Senator family Cormann, uh, tax time benefit for the answer and the like. has expired. Senator McMahon. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister outline the benefits of the Indonesia Australia? Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement and inform the Senate when the agreement will enter into force. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator McMahon for her question and, of course, uh, knowing that uh, the Northern Territory in particular has 
uh, enormous opportunities uh, from closer relations between Australia and Indonesia, uh, and I know that your passion there is, is to see those opportunities realised. So I'm very pleased to inform uh, Senator McMahon and the, uh, and the Senate uh, that following discussions I had early last week with my Indonesian counterpart, Agus Supermanto, that uh, Indonesia completed last week its domestic ratification procedures uh, and provided formal notification to Australia which means that the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement will enter into force on 5 July. Uh, closer economic relations and closer strategic relations between Australia and Indonesia has been a long-term objective for Australian governments of all political persuasions. And I do note, uh, as IASEPA heads towards entry into force, the bipartisan support that was offered uh, for the agreement uh, and the legislation enabling it. It is crucial that we see uh, this continued strength and growth in the relationship between Australia and Indonesia uh, and, indeed, the trade opportunities that it will create. And the trade opportun opportunities from IASEPA uh, are quite real and tangible. Uh, over 99 per cent of Australian goods exports to Indonesia uh, will enter duty-free or under significantly preferential arrangements. Uh, this will see some 575,000 live cattle able to enter Indonesia duty-free in year one. Some 500,000 tonnes of feed grains, including wheat and barley and other grains, be able to enter duty-free in year one. Up to an estimated 455 semi-trailer load equivalents of oranges will enter duty-free. Potatoes, carrots, frozen beef and sheep meat tariffs, dairy tariffs, all of them being reduced, as well as goods such as rolled coil steel, uh, to the equivalent almost to make enough for five Sydney Harbour bridges Order. each year. Senator Birmingham. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate of the feedback from farmers and industry groups about the agreement, which will provide new market opportunities and protect livelihoods for our farmers and business owners? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, given the scale of the new opportunity created with Indonesia as, uh, as a large and, uh, and we trust, still fast-growing economy once it recovers from the challenges of COVID-19, there's been very warm reaction from Australian farming and other industry representatives. Uh, uh, the chairman of Grain Growers said that access to this new feed grain market is great news and timing could not be better. We have safe, nutritious grains for Australians as well as our closest neighbours. Uh, Ausvegers, National Manager of Export Development, said that this should lead to an immediate increase of over 300 per cent in current trade values of fresh vegetables to Indonesia. The National Farmers Federation said uh, that the entry into force of IASEPA provides some much-needed perspective for Australia's farmers, encouraging us to look beyond the present hardships of drought, bushfires and coronavirus and to the bright future ahead. While the Business Council of Australia said that it will help open new markets, create new jobs and build a stronger recovery for both nations, and that is certainly the government's Order, aspiration to see that Senator strength for Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the coalition government working to keep trade flowing, to keep more Australians in work? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, despite the challenges posed by COVID-19, the latest ABS trade data shows that Australia recently recorded our 27th consecutive monthly trade surplus. And indeed, it was a record, another record trade surplus to the tune of some $10.6 billion. And I'm pleased to highlight for Senator McMahon's benefit uh, and, uh, uh, and others from the Northern Territory uh, that this included a record value of goods exports and that indeed goods exports from the Northern Territory increased in 2019 by some 73 per cent uh, under the policy settings uh, of our government. Uh, but during the month of March, we saw strong goods exports growth to a range of different markets for Australia, a 354 per cent increase in goods exports to Hong Kong, a 30 per cent increase to the Republic of Korea, a 96 per cent increase to the United Kingdom and a 51 per cent increase to the United States of America. Now, all of this demonstrating that the diversity of opportunities available to Australian exporters continues to grow Order. and they continue to Senator seize Birmingham. those opportunities. Time for the answers expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for Defence, Minister Reynolds. In July 1940, the mortally wounded leading seaman Jack Mantle trained his weapon on a swarm of Nazi, Nazi Stukas attacking HMAS Foilback. Jack Mantle was awarded the Victorian Cross. Two years later, the HMAS 
Armadale was hit by Japanese aircraft and began to sink rapidly. 18-year-old ordinary seaman Teddy Sheen was wounded during the attack, but rather than flee, he strapped himself to his anti-aircraft cannon and opened fire. That decision to tie his fate to a gun sinking to the bottom of the ocean brought down two planes and helped save the lives of 49 crew. You have the power to recommend Teddy for Australia's highest military honour, the Victorian Cross. So our question from Tasmania is this. What more could Teddy Sheen have possibly done to have earned a Victorian Cross? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank very much uh, Senator Lambie for that question. Uh, Senator Lambie, I am very well aware of the heroism uh, and the service and the sacrifice of Teddy Sheehan. He did the Australian Navy a great credit, and he is worthy of significant acknowledgement. Uh, the issue you raise in terms of a posthumous Victoria Cross is a very challenging policy issue, uh, it, which does not in any way detract from uh, his worthiness in terms of his service. Uh, Senator Lambie, I will take that question on notice because I'll have to uh, find out the status of this and I will come back to you at the earliest possible opportunity. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The government and yourself have had the Teddy Sheen report for the Awards and Honours Tribunal since July 2019. We're nearly 12 months on. Uh, your government and yourself have blocked every effort to get it released because you say you're preparing a response. How long does it take to say accept or does not accept to a document? What is the hold-up? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And again, I will, uh, Senator Lambie, take that on notice and get back to you at the earliest possible opportunity. I do need to check with the Minister for Veterans Affairs, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Gary Ivory, the nephew of Teddy Sheen, wrote to the Prime Minister in February asking for an update on when to expect a response from the government. Out of respect to Gary Ivory, he's yet to hear back. Teddy's been waiting for recognition for, 47, for, for 78 years. How long is the Prime Minister planning to keep his nephew waiting? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And again, I will take that on notice and I will get back to you at the earliest possible opportunity. Uh, and I do, as I said, I do understand uh, the passion uh, for his service and his contribution to our nation, not only by Tasmanians, uh, but by all naval personnel and, in fact, all Australians. But as I said, uh, the awarding of a posthumous VC is not a simple issue. But I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can, Senator Lambie. You have my word on that. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. On 20 April, superannuation funds wrote to the Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Senator Hume, outlining their concern about the risk of fraud under the government's early superannuation scheme and calling on the government to enact greater protections. On 1 May, the very same day that the government received advice from the AFP saying that it was investigating suspected fraud in the scheme, Assistant Minister Hume replied to concerned superannuation funds saying the government had, and I quote, substantial checks in place to guard against fraud. Does the Prime Minister stand by Senator Hume's claim? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. No, thank you very much, Mr President. Of course he does. Uh, Senator Hume is doing an outstanding job, an absolutely outstanding job uh, in, in, in helping in helping the government develop our response, supporting, supporting Australians through this, through this crisis, supporting Australians through this crisis, helping Australians who, are, uh, who have lost their job or who have lost significant work hours, who are facing significant financial challenges, to be able to get through this period, pay the mortgage, pay the, pay, 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 pay the fees, pay the, pay the fees that they're facing by accessing, by accessing, uh, com by accessing some of their superannuation early. This is actually not a new system. Uh, hardship provisions and early access to superannuation under hardship provisions uh, is a well-established system. Uh, we, we, have, we have adopted it in this context. And of course, uh, the correspondence that the senator refers senator, to had some senator other Watt. assertions too, like that somehow $50 billion worth of uh, superannuation savings would walk out the door. We always said that that was an excessive and an exaggerated uh, prediction and, and if you look at the figures that the way they have been order, uh, developing, Senator that Coleman, is indeed been proven McAllister to be right. Point of order. Senator McAllister? I wish to raise, raise a point of order about relevance. Uh, I am hoping to learn whether the Prime Minister stands by the Minister's claim that substantial checks were in place to guard against fraud. 
That is the materialist issue in this question, and I would like an answer. Um, that is on the point of order, or on the point of order, Senator McAllister, that was the conclusion of your question. I am listening carefully to the minister's answer. I can't instruct him which part of a question to answer, but he is allowed to address any parts of the preamble to that part, that concluding question. So I'm listening carefully to the minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Senator Hume was right. The prime minister is right. Of course, there are substantial checks and balances, but any program, any government program, any business is exposed to the risk of fraud. And when, if and when fraud does occur, you take appropriate action. And of course, appropriate action was taken. This is not a widespread problem. It is an isolated problem. But of course, uh, as is appropriate, I mean, there, there is there is there is fraud in relation to job seeker. There's fraud. I mean. Do do you suggest that we should close down the entire job seeker program because there is a risk of fraud? There is a risk of fraud in relation to any government program, and of course you put appropriate checks and balances in place, which does not entirely eliminate the risk of fraud. But when fraud is detected, uh, you take action, and that is of course what is happening consistent with uh, the laws that this parliament passed with your support. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why did it take the government seven days from receiving advice from the AFP about suspected fraud to suspend assessments under the scheme? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. As I've indicated, th these, these, these were isolated examples and appropriate action was taken. The minister has concluded his answer. Senator McAllister, a supplement final supplementary question. Only three days after the government suspended assessments under the scheme, the responsible minister reopened assessments. Can the minister guarantee no further Australians will be defrauded of their retirement savings through this scheme? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Can Senator McAllister guarantee that nobody in Australia will speed because of speed limits? Uh... Oh, order. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. And he might think it's funny to dismiss this, but they are the government, and the question is about the government's program and the probity of the government's program. So, so, Could the on, minister on, please be directly on, relevant to the question? On, on, with, with respect, on the point of order, I mean the minister had been speaking for seven seconds. I, I, I didn't have him at a full stop at that point. Um, I don't believe that actually I don't believe if he was prefacing his answer with such a statement that I would be in a position to rule it as not being directly relevant seven seconds into the answer. I've allowed you to challenge the minister's answer. There's a time for debating it after question time. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. It might be very hard for Labor senators to understand, but for Australian families facing hardship uh, in this, during this period, this is actually an important option for them to be able to uh, release some of their own money, some of their own money in order to, uh, in order to deal Watt. with their cost of living pressures through this period. Uh, appropriate checks and balances are in place and of course we will continue to Wong take action as appropriate. Direct relevance. The minister was asked a specific question about guaranteeing that no further Australians would be defrauded under your scheme. Which I can answer, Mr President. Um, with, with respect, Senator Wong, I mean, the, the, uh, can, I, can, I, can I conclude my? And I'll, I'll take a point of order. I'll take a further point of order after I rule. Um, you, your point of order there moves into asking me to instruct the minister how to answer a question, which I don't believe is within my power. He was talking about the risk of fraud or otherwise, as I was listening to in the program. I believe that is being directly relevant, and there's an opportunity to debate it afterwards. I can't instruct him to um, answer a question or use a particular term. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. We will continue, we will continue to manage this program appropriately, which is very popular, and we will ensure that all Australia's interests uh, Australia's interests are appropriately looked after. Order. Order on my left. Senator Patterson. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President, and what an excellent answer about an excellent program. But uh, my question is for the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on what actions Defence has been taking in support of whole of government efforts to reduce the spread of COVID-19? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank uh, Senator Patterson for that question. And the answer is, I certainly can. Uh, while this government has been focused on protecting Australians uh, and enabling Australians to live safely in the age of COVID, 
Uh, defence has yet again been playing its part. And it's not only our men and women in uniform across the three services, it's also uh, personnel from right across the Department of Defence who have been assisting in the whole of government response right across this nation. Uh, Defence has been responding in four key ways. We established in March a COVID-19 task force, and the four areas of main response are assisting states and territories with their health responses, uh, secondly, assisting with the economic stimulus activities, uh, particularly with our engagement with defence industry. Uh, also ensuring, of course, that our men and women overseas, there are a thousand of them, are uh, safe and well, uh, and also dealing with all of the other issues of national security. But fourthly, we have been providing additional support to our near neighbours, because clearly uh, the threat of COVID-19 in many of our smaller Pacific nations in particular has the potential to be quite catastrophic. Uh, today we have over 2,000 ADF personnel on the ground doing tasks ranging from contact tracing, comp quarantine compliance and also, importantly, protecting our Indigenous communities. Uh, for over a month, just a few examples, for over a month, a small team of highly qualified ADF engineering maintenance specialists helped a surgical face mask company in Shepparton boost the output uh, exponentially of life-saving facial masks uh, until uh, sufficient civilians were able to be trained to actually now run that facility. And more recently, as part of an osmat led Commonwealth team, the ADF deployed 50 personnel to the Northwest Regional Hospital in Burnie for two weeks to allow the staff to go into isolation and provide much needed medical support to over 400 uh, residents of Northwest Tasmania. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister inform the Senate what defence science and technology have been doing to support the whole of government uh, efforts on COVID 19? Senator Reynolds. Well, again, thank you very much, Senator Patterson, uh, for that question. Without question, the men and women of our, science and techno our defence science and technology group are, without doubt, some of the smartest and most capable men and women uh, in, in the world. And I'm extremely proud of the contribution that our defence scientists have made, contributing their expertise and their smarts to research in COVID-19 virus and also for mitigation activities. Uh, Defence has partnered with a South Australian company, Axiom Precision Manufacturing, to rapidly produce a new face shield, uh, boosting the supply and also expanding uh, local industry capability. Our Chief Defence Scientist, Professor Tanya Monroe, is leading a rapid response groomed group aimed at repurposing in existing non-invasive ventilators and turning them into invasive ventilators. Uh, Defence is also researching the virus's survivability on a range of different surfaces, and we're doing that in conjunction with a range of international partners. And these are just a few examples Order. of what Senator the Defence Science and Technology Group is the doing. The answer has expired. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what actions the Australian Signals Directorate have been taking to protect Australians online and to support Australia's economic resilience in response to COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, Mr. President and uh, Senator, for that question. Again, another part of the defence portfolio that is doing outstanding work as part of our national response to COVID-19. The Australian Cyber Security Centre is protecting Australian families and businesses uh, against COVID-19-related cybercrime and, importantly, cyber attacks against critical uh, areas such as our health agencies and uh, companies. So to identify and disrupt malicious cyber criminals offshore, the ACSC is closely collaborating with industry here in Australia and overseas, with law enforcement, with government agencies and also with our telecommunication providers. But they're also working with frontline healthcare providers to reduce their risk of cyber compromise at this time. The Australian Signals Directorate itself is using uh, its offensive cyber capabilities to disrupt uh, foreign COVID-19 related cyber criminals. And these are criminals are attempting to exploit Order. Australians Senator in this time Reynolds, of crisis, time which is utterly has despicable. Expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In response to a question on ABC yesterday about Australians being defrauded of their retirement savings, Senator Bragg said that fraud resulting from the Commonwealth's or the government's early super access scheme was, and I quote, an immaterial component. Is Senator Bragg correct? 
Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. About $10 billion or uh, thereabouts uh, in Order. early uh, release superannuation payments have been released back to the owners of that money, people saving for their retirement, to help them deal with the challenging circumstances, the challenging financial circumstances they are facing. Uh, and there has been a comparatively minor incidence of fraud, which has been detected, which has been acted upon, and the interests of those impacted Australians will of course, will of course be looked after. Of course, they will be, of course that will be addressed as appropriate. But let me tell you, this is an important program. It's a popular program. We will continue to take effective action to prevent, to prevent fraud and, of course, to, uh, to deal with it if and where that occurs. And anyone who commits fraud will have the book thrown at them. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. While Australians facing financial hardship have resorted to access their retirement savings early in the absence of adequate government uh, assistance, Senator Bragg has said, and I quote, I think it's a good idea to have access regimes like this on a more permanent basis. Does the minister agree with Senator Bragg? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, the President, as I've said in response to an earlier question, uh, individual members and senators uh, on the Liberal National side are uh, free to express their views and express to speak their mind. I know that on the socialist side of the chamber that is not so easy, but on our side, people can speak their mind. But as far as the government's position is concerned, the measures, the support measures that we have put in place in the context of uh, helping people to transition through the challenging period that we are going through now are temporary. They're not ongoing. Uh, and uh, we are not considering making any of the temporary measures uh, ongoing, I, not this one and not any of the other temporary measures. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Uh, in light of that answer, Minister, do you agree that Senator Bragg's plan would undermine Australia's world-class superannuation regime? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. There's just no uh, truth to the premise of this question at all because there's no proposition by government to go down that path. Uh, so the government is not proposing to make that change. Uh, access, early access to superannuation under hardship provisions is a long-standing arrangement that has been in place, uh, you know, I, I would think, uh, since inception of compulsory super, if not soon thereafter, and it's appropriate for that to be in place. Uh, it's been uh, adjusted as we are going through this period to help Australian families get early access to the superannuation in the context of the hardship they uh, may be facing, uh, given the economic impact of the coronavirus, crisis. Now, that is entirely appropriate, uh, but uh, this is a temporary measure. We're not proposing to make it permanent. We don't think that would be appropriate, and that is not something that is uh, on the table. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government supporting Australians who are being impacted by the economic downturn resulting from the coronavirus pandemic? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and can I um, thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question and, and the opportunity to advise the Chamber of the supercharging of the welfare system that has been put in place to help people who find themselves unemployed during this COVID virus outbreak. Um, as we um, have already mentioned, uh, there is a temporary uh, supplement that is being paid at a rate of $550 a fortnight to people who are on payment. That means that anybody who is currently eligible for a job seeker payment will receive in, in, addition, uh, in excess of $1,100 a fortnight for the duration of the pandemic. Uh, and this is being paid not just to new people who have come onto payment, but also to people who find themselves uh, who found themselves already on payment. Job seeker payment, youth allowance payment, parenting payment, people who were on farm household allowance, and those on special benefit. But we've also relaxed a number of criteria. Uh, to make sure that those people who find themselves coming on to unemployment through no fault of their own are going to have a quick and easy access to be able to get the support that they're going to need during this pandemic. For instance, we did, we've waived the, the one-week ordinary waiting period, uh, we've waived the liquid asset waiting period, and we've also, for our, uh, our permanent residents uh, on their way, pathway to permanent residency and, and a citizenship of Australia, we've waived the newly arrived residents waiting period. But we've also relaxed uh, the income test measures to ensure, uh, for partner incomes to ensure those people that find themselves 
uh, requiring job seeker payments uh, if their pa partner's payment is, uh, is less than $3,700 per fortnight, they will also be able to get access to the job seeker payment uh, or part thereof. This is in addition to the $750 um, pay one-off payment that was made in early April to people, all people on payments and a further $750 uh, payment that will be made in July to those people that haven't been eligible for the job seeker payment uh, corona supplement. Order. Senator Rustin. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, what in particular is the government doing to support people with a disability during this time? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. From the outset, the Morrison government has taken very decisive action to make sure that we protect the lives of, uh, of Australians who live with disability. Uh, they uh, released um, early on the management and operational plan for COVID-19 for people with a disability, which was received uh, hu with huge um, acclamation from the sector and, uh, and was a significant milestone in the health response to make sure that people with disability had the protection that they needed during this crisis. But in addition to that, through the social services portfolio, we've announced another 90, uh, over $90 million worth of uh, initiatives in a support package to help uh, Australians, particularly those that find themselves in difficult in employment situations. Um, in addition to that, we have put uh, $2 million to a dedicated phone line to support our current um, web-based um, outreach programs to make sure that we are able to provide the advice and the direction to service that people with disability may be requiring information about during this crisis. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government ensuring stability of services to help protect the lives and livelihoods during this coronavirus pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the absolute focus of this government during this crisis has been to save lives and then to save livelihoods and to make sure that we can assist Australians to be able to deal with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. To that end, there have been a number of grants that exist within the Department of Social Services that we, uh, that we use to deliver essential services to all Australians. And in April, uh, I announced a $64 million extension to about 3,000 grant recipients to the 31st of March 2021. Uh, those are the grants that would have possibly um, ceased uh, in the coming months. This is to make sure that we are able to uh, can maintain a continuity of service throughout this time to make sure that we're providing the services to Australians, uh, particularly those that are most at risk of this uh, pandemic. Uh, we acknowledge we have a long road ahead uh, and we are here to make sure that we support all Australians with this great challenge. We have planned for the worst and we are working hard to make sure that does Order. not happen. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister of Foreign, for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. The Sunday Mail Brisbane reported that LNP member for Dawson, Mr Christensen, blindsided cabinet ministers by launching an inquiry into diversifying Australia's trade and investment profile by the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth. When did the minister first become aware of the inquiry? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong for her question. As I understand it, the inquiry itself was commenced uh, some months ago uh, in February of this year. Senator Wong, supplementary question. Did Mr. Cri I ask a supplementary. Did Mr. Christensen consult with the minister about his approach before publicising his intentions in the media? Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for her question. Uh, as the senator would be well aware, there are countless inquiries undertaken across the parliament, in the Senate, in the House, and in joint committees. And I certainly don't expect that every chair will consult with every minister in that uh, process. Mr. Christensen uh, did not raise the particular inquiry with me, largely because it had, of course, commenced several months ago in February of this year. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Does the minister believe it is in the national interest for a backbench LNP member to be so prominent in the management of Australia's largest trading relationship? And does the minister endorse Mr Christensen's actions? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, it's uh, certainly the case that uh, Australia's democratic system of uh, government allows, respects, uh, indeed uh, welcomes members of parliament having a voice on issues across the nation, issues in Australia's national interest. It's one of the reasons why we come to this place to go to work. It's one of the reasons why we do this job. 
It's one of the reasons that we are blessed with the privilege and the opportunity of standing up in a House of Parliament, freely and democratically elected to do that job. So, Mr. President, I understand the issues that prompt Senator Wong to ask that question, but for my part, I am very strongly attached to Australia's democratic processes, and I will continue to be so. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My, thank you very much. Order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, will I go ahead or? Yes, Senator Bragg. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic response to the coronavirus pandemic is helping small and family businesses? to remain resilient and supporting the livelihoods of business owners and their employees during this unprecedented economic crisis. Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for his question. Small and family business, uh, they are indeed the backbone of the Australian economy, and the Morrison government has put in place uh, a significant range of support measures to help them through the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, we have an investment of $320 billion across the forward estimates, representing 16.4 per cent of annual GDP. Mr President, as the Minister for Finance has said today, the support is temporary, measured and scalable. And a centrepiece, of course, of this historic support package is our $130 billion JobKeeper payment. Mr President, in the absence of the Morrison government's JobKeeper payment, Treasury estimates that unemployment would have been at least five percentage points higher and would have peaked at around 15 per cent in the September quarter. Mr President, the ATO has now received around 835,000 enrolments from entities that employ over 5.5 million Australians. Money began flowing back to these businesses last week. And, uh, as a government, we are confident that the JobKeeper payment and the ability to maintain that connection between employers and employees will enable those businesses to return with their teams as soon as they are able to. Mr President, in addition to the $130 billion JobKeeper payment, we are also providing much-needed cash flow support to small and medium businesses, with boosts of between $20,000 and up to $100,000 to eligible businesses delivered through credits in the Business Activity Statement system. The measure has gone a long way to improve confidence among our small and medium businesses. Mr President, small and medium businesses are the backbone of the Australian economy, and we will continue to support them. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. What actions is the government taking to ensure small businesses can access the cash they need during this time? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And we know that cash flow remains critical, in particular at this time, to small and family businesses. Mr. President, the boosting cash flow measure to date has delivered almost $7.79 billion in cash flow to nearly 440,000 businesses. Via this measure, money is going directly into the bank accounts of these small and medium businesses who employ Australians. Mr President, we're also facilitating greater access to finance through the SME guarantee. This is helping small and medium businesses access much needed funds by providing lenders with a guarantee of 50% of new unsecured loans up to $250,000. Almost $1 billion of loans to small businesses have been approved to date. Again, small and medium businesses, the backbone of the Australian economy, and we will continue to support them. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What steps is the government taking to ensure small and family businesses are able to recover once restrictions are lifted? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, as we saw last Friday with the meeting of National Cabinet, we are now on the pathway or the road to recovery through the three-step process that has now been implemented 
by the state and territory governments. We have one goal in 2020, and that is, of course, to protect, in the first instance, the health and the well-being of Australians and their livelihoods through what is a global crisis, and to ensure that when the recovery comes, we are well positioned to bounce back strongly on the other side. Mr President, as the Prime Minister has said, the pathway to, be our, to our recovery will be through growing the Australian economy, and you do this by supporting your small and medium businesses who employ nearly 7 million Australians. Mr President, when we came to government, we backed these businesses through lower taxes, cutting red tape and providing incentives for them to invest back into their businesses. And through this crisis, we will continue to support them because they are the backbone of Order. the Australian Senator economy. Cash. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. There are, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Wong and Gallagher. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, all of us in this chamber would acknowledge that right now Australia and the world faces incredible challenges. Coronavirus, tragically, has led to the, death of the, the deaths of 280,000 people worldwide, including 97 here in Australia. And now, as we appear to be emerging from the worst of the health crisis in Australia, we face a significant economic and unemployment challenge. We've seen hundreds of thousands of Australians lose their jobs, we've seen small businesses destroyed, and we've seen particular impacts on, on certain industries, most of all the hospitality industry, which has seen one in three jobs disappear in such a short uh, uh, period of time. Treasury and the Reserve Bank are predicting that unemployment will remain high for the rest of this year. Uh, Deloitte yesterday replaced, re released a report which said that unemployment won't reach pre-COVID levels until at least 2024. So we're looking at high unemployment, uh, according to Deloitte, for another four years. This week, as we have returned to Parliament, we've heard two very different approaches outlined for how the country should respond to this crisis and how we should approach economic recovery. Yesterday, the federal Labor leader, Mr Albanese, gave a speech which outlined Labor's approach to how we should recover. And what he was saying was that we shouldn't just go back to the, the way things were. We need to build an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We need to build a stronger, fairer economy with a focus on reducing unemployment and underemployment. Sadly, we are seeing a very different approach from the government, and we saw that here again today in question time. Thanks. The approach well, that this come. government is taking was described by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer recently as one of snapback. They seem to live in this mythical economic world where everything can just snap back to the way things were. That's assuming, of course, that you think that everything was perfect in the first place. They seem to think that we can snap back overnight uh, to a world in which we still had low productivity, high, uh, high unemployment, uh, low economic growth, low business investment wages that were stagnant and high levels of insecure work. That's the kind of world that this government thinks that we can snap back to. And nowhere is this approach more on display at the moment with the government's statements around its intentions in relation to the JobKeeper payment. This, of course, was the wage subsidy which this government had to be dragged kicking and screaming to implement uh, against the calls of Labor, uh, the union movement and businesses. They finally got there. Uh, and, and finally implemented the JobKeeper payment. But the fact that they were opposed to it from day one continues to be on display with early calls from members of this government to start winding it back. That's what snapback means under this government. It means winding back and cutting off the very payments that this government has finally put in place to try to keep this economy alive and to try to keep people in work. We've seen over the last few days reports that the government wants to wind back the JobKeeper payment. And that's before unemployment has even peaked. The reports from the Treasury and the Reserve Bank are, are that we won't hit uh, the maximum rate of unemployment of around 10 per cent until around June this year. So before we've even seen unemployment peak, we've got members of this government who want to start winding back the JobKeeper payment. 
In fact, there are many businesses across Australia who are yet to even receive JobKeeper payments uh, to reimburse them for payments they've made to their workers. And before the businesses have even started to receive the JobKeeper payment, we've seen members of this government want to start winding it back. Today, in question time, uh, Minister Cormann, the finance minister, uh, was asked uh, whether the government was considering a wind back. And on the one hand, he tells us that the government isn't considering an early end to the JobKeeper payment, but then he goes on to confirm that it act is actually under review. And it's that second answer which is the most important. What it shows in the fact that this government is already reviewing the JobKeeper payment before it's even been received by some businesses, before unemployment has even peaked, is that the clock is ticking for the JobKeeper payment. The, the clock is ticking and the snapback has begun. The snapback that this government wants to see in place of a return to low wages, uh, higher than average unemployment and low economic growth has actually begun. Jason Falinski, the member for McKellar, today has been reported as saying that he thinks that we should turn off the JobKeeper payment ASAP. As soon as schools go back, then it should go. The snapback has begun. Now, there are many business groups in my home state of Queensland uh, who, want us, who are saying that cutting the JobKeeper payment would be disastrous for the economy. They know that snapback would be disastrous. It's about time the Thank government you, did Senator too. Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Seselja. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, can I start by um, outlining, um, I think, in support of uh, the Minister of Finance's statement today uh, to the Senate and indeed the Treasurer's statement uh, to the House. Uh, the significant challenges that this nation uh, is facing uh, at the moment, I think the very strong way that we have responded to those challenges as a nation, uh, this health crisis and this economic crisis, uh, and then uh, to point to the way forward. Uh, there is no doubt, uh, there is no doubt uh, that we faced uh, only a short few weeks ago, uh, it seems a lot longer, uh, but only a few weeks ago, as the significance of this pandemic uh, became apparent, uh, we faced an unprecedented health and economic crisis. And I think as a nation, we can be very, very proud of how we have responded uh, to that crisis. Uh, when it comes to dealing with the health crisis, uh, through the leadership uh, of the Prime Minister and the Health Minister and the Cabinet, along with the, uh, in, and indeed informing the National Cabinet, uh, we have seen a response that I think is the envy uh, of most of the rest of the world. Uh, you would not want to be uh, in virtually any other country in dealing uh, with this significant challenge uh, than in Australia right now. Uh, but notwithstanding that, uh, it has had a major impact on Australia, even though our relative performance has been much better uh, than most other comparable countries. It has had a health impact, and of course we mourn those who have been lost and of course the loved ones who are left behind and those who have suffered and our frontline health workers who have been dealing with that. Uh, but the economic impact has been huge. And as we have dealt with that economic impact, uh, we have sought to do it based on principles uh, and based on values. And as we seek to come out of this economic and health crisis, uh, we will maintain that approach. We will maintain that approach. And I'll, I'll get to uh, briefly the contrast in a moment. Uh, but we have to go back to the starting point of what we had. And what we heard there from Senator Watt and what we've heard from the Labor Party uh, generally in their criticism is this big lie, uh, and it is a big lie, uh, where they claim that the Australian economy was not doing well, was not strong going into this crisis. Uh, that is not true. That, is, that was not the view of the Reserve Bank. That was not the, re the view of the IMF. You know, we just had Senator Watt uh, saying, well, we had high unemployment. Uh, well, it was 5.1 per cent going into this crisis. 5.1 per cent, and we saw economic growth ticking up. Uh, we saw expected economic growth in 2020 and 2021 being higher than virtually every other G7 economy. So this big lie that the Labor Party looks to retail to try and make a political point during this crisis that our economy was weak is wrong. Uh, we were strengthening our economy uh, based on our policies. Uh, we were strengthening our budget. And isn't it a great thing that we went into this crisis uh, with a budgetary position which is 
far better, vastly better than virtually every other comparable nation, uh, with a debt to GDP ratio a quarter of what we see in places like the United States and the UK, and about a seventh in places like Japan. Uh, that's no thanks to the Labor Party. Uh, we inherited a $48 billion deficit and we brought the budget back into balance. We saw unemployment coming down with 1.5 million jobs being created. Uh, so that track record holds us in good stead. Uh, but, Deputy President, these are great and challenging times. Uh, and as a government, we are working with the Australian people, we are working with state and territory governments to deliver for the Australian people. Uh, our absolute focus is on keeping Australians safe during this health crisis and in protecting their livelihoods. And as we open up uh, our society again, we want to open up our economy as, as soon as it is safe to do so. Now, we hear the alternative approaches from the Labor Party. They want to permanently put government at the centre of our national life. We heard it again from the Shadow Finance Minister today when she was critical of policies like cutting taxes. The Shadow Finance Minister critical of policies like cutting taxes. Well, as we come out of this, I think Australians can take great comfort from the way we have handled this crisis to date. And as we continue to work together, uh, we can bring our economy back to where it needs to be. It's not going to happen by government continuing to be at the centre of things. It's going to be small and medium and large enterprises getting on, creating jobs on behalf of all Australians. Those are the policies Thank we're going to continue to pursue as we recover. Thank you, Senator Selger. Your time has expired. We have uh, Senator Sheldon, if you come to the lectern. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you, uh, Deputy um, uh, President. Well, first of all, isn't that an extraordinary uh, description of what's happened in the economy pre-COVID-19? Pre here's the party, here's the government that doubled the debt. But also, let's look at today. We've got a budget. You know, this is normally budget day, but we've got no budget. But we've also got a government without a plan, without a plan of what we do moving out of this COVID-19 period. But don't worry. It's probably a little bit unfair to say they don't have a plan. They have a plan to snap back to no plan. That's their strategy. Let's snap back to no plan. In actual fact, in the case of a number of their uh, backbenchers and others within their, on their side, they have a plan to snap back real quickly to no plan. In actual fact, in the case of underemployment, let's look at what we'd be snapping back to. Pre-COVID-19, Australia had 1.23 million workers wanting more hours than they were getting—8.7 per cent of the workforce. Even before COVID-19 layoffs, the headline unemployment rate in Australia sat at 5.3 per cent, the number of people who either can't get a job or can't get the hours they want spiked under the Morrison government to 13.8 per cent. Snap back. They want to snap back, and I'll give you an example a survey by the Transport Workers Union of Jetstar workers, where 90 per cent of Jetstar workers want more hours. Not only is Jetstar refusing to guarantee workers' hours in future arrangements, but their agreement also restricts workers from getting another job in aviation. Snap back. Let's look at other snap back strategies that this government's got underemployment. Snap back, wage theft. What's the plan? Billions of dollars taken out of our economy, and that's their snap back plan. We see people having their money stolen. We see superannuation theft. We see companies that have been unfairly competed with, that are doing the right thing, abiding by the law, but they want to snap back. In actual fact, they want to snap back a bit further, because in the case of the gig economy, Except for probably Senator Bragg, not many people would have picked this up. But there was a decision made by the Fair Work Commission, rightly looking at the laws, which is going to be challenged in the High Court, about what rights people have in the new economy, in the gig economy. It actually made a decision that many workers in the gig economy, particularly in Uber, would not have any rights, and particularly in the case that was taken forward for the Gupta family, Amita and Santosh who are taking, doing some work to support the dis uh, disability pension that they were on. They wanted the right of reinstatement after being victimised, they felt, by the company. Now, what does a gig economy look like? 
In the case of these workers, they are averaging $7.85 an hour, half the minimum wage. Snap back. That's what this government wants to see. Snap back, not just to pre-COVID-19, but snap back in the case of the gig economy, the sort of practices that were happening with piecework in the 1800s. When they snap back, they snap way back. And of course, snap back when it comes to Newstart. $40 a day. How could you possibly see that anybody would have the capacity to turn around and survive on that sort of income? Snap back. But let's look at the consequences of the last recession, major recession that we had in 1990-91, where the Secretary Treasury, uh, the Treasury Secretary Stephen Kennedy made the comment, whilst he's been cross-examined, cross-questioned at uh, a Senate hearing, that in 1990-91 recession, almost 1.2 million Australians had manufacturing jobs. More than 100,000 jobs were lost from that sector in a two-year period. And of course, despite a larger economy and workforce, the number of manufacturing workers today is 25 per cent below the pre-1991 peak. Snap back. We have to have a plan. We have to have a plan about how we actually move this economy forward, how we deal with a new economy, how we deal with the consequences of COVID-19 and the, and the, uh, the consequences, economic cons consequences that we're facing, and make some decisions about how we actually not snap off our economy but actually turn it around and make it work for us. It's critically important whether you're in suffering from wage theft in the gig economy thank or you, in the manufacturing Senator Sheldon, sector. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, before I, I get to uh, uh, the substance of my contribution, taking note on the, uh, on the questions asked by the opposition today, I, I too would like to commend uh, the government, but all governments around Australia, indeed the uh, the entire Australian people for how they have responded, uh, combined and acted uh, over the past uh, two months. Uh, uh, it's perhaps becoming too easy to forget that uh, two months or so ago when we left this place and basically suspended at least normal operations of the parliament, uh, uh, we had our cases growing at uh, well above 20 per cent a day. It was very much on an exponential growth path and if that had continued uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians would have been infected. Thousands more would have died, unfortunately, if we continued on that path. Uh, it has been a remarkable turnaround. Uh, uh, it has been at least in part testament to the strong response of the Australian people and the combined and consistent actions of Australian governments, uh, this one here in Canberra but also right around the country. Uh, I think um, at least I, I take some heart today that in, in the, in the the only way possible for an opposition to do that they too paid some credit to the government for its actions over the past couple of months. Uh, 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 there's very little indeed. I, I didn't really pick up any criticism uh, in question time of what the government has done uh, over the past uh, two months in response to this global pandemic. The substance of the uh, opposition's points today were all about what we might do that they, what, we might, what they fear we might do in the future. Uh, there was very, very little, if nothing, about what is actually being done. And I, I do take some heart from the fact that I know an opposition can't come into question time and, 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 and put up Dorothy Dix's and, and suggest what a great job uh, the government has done that would in fact be uh, perhaps a, uh, a, 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 an incorrect application of the tools here for us as senators, where, where he, the opposition is there to, to hold the government to account. So it, it can't just come in here and and, and uh, provide bouquets to, I think, a government that has done a, a pretty good job in the Australian public spec. So I understand that. But let's be clear what the opposition has put forward today is only criticisms of what might some hypothetical in the future government do. So the contributions we've just heard are all about uh, how and when, maybe if uh, this, the JobKeeper program is, is changed or, or amended. Uh, how, if, or what happens uh, to, uh, to the withdrawals and drawdowns uh, on, on superannuation. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, critiques of future actions that have not happened uh, don't carry all that much weight, but they carry even little weight, little weight here because they are caricatures of future 
decisions that a government might take. In the Labor Party's mind, we over here on this side are all cigar chomping, uh, 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 big business loving, uh, 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 cashed up senators. That's their, that's their caricature of us. And, and you can see in their, in their nightmarish uh, Labor centred vision of the future that that's where they think things will be going. Well, I think that it's clearly a caricature and clearly demonstrated to be a caricature by the actions of this government in the last couple of months. Uh, we have taken action to support workers, enormous action. We were criticised a few months ago for being, uh, being enslaved to a, uh, uh, to a rock solid commitment to a budget surplus. Obviously, we weren't enslaved to such a commitment because when action was required, when we had to uh, respond uh, to help and assist thousands of Australians, we did that very thing. And we ditched what was, yes, a very important commitment of ours, what was something we worked very hard to achieve to put this nation back into surplus, but it had to be ditched for the greater good, and we showed ourselves uh, with the pragmatism to do that. Now, how we've acted in the last couple of months is exactly how we'll act in the months ahead. The government will be pragmatic. It will be sensible. Uh, it will respond to the needs uh, and concerns of average Australian citizens. Uh, and, of course, we will seek to manage uh, the money that ultimately is other people's, that is Australians, that has to be repaid as carefully as possible. Because in terms of the future, which today's question time is focused on, in terms of the future, the question that will have to be asked is, is which, which government, which side of politics do the Australian people trust to get people back to work, uh, to restart this economy? Because we cannot continue to subsidise the, the wages of millions of Australians day in, day out. Uh, we cannot continue to, to double welfare payments on an unending basis. We will have to get Australians back to work, and the question that the Australian people will ask is who is the best to be trusted uh, to unlock business, to get people employed and get our country back onto the strong track it was on before Thank you, Senator Canavan. Your time has expired, and we have Senator Walsh up at the lectern. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy President. And we ask questions today about the government's plans to uh, snap back the JobKeeper program uh, as calls from their backbench grow to snap back and cut back vital support to the Australian people. Uh, and of course, this is a program that the union movement and the Labor Party advocated for and pushed the government to adopt. Uh, and this is a program that the backbench Liberals, the ideologues in the Liberal Party, can't wait to get rid of. They are desperate to snap back the government's support. They are desperate to let the markets rip again. And they are desperate to do this just at the time when Australians need their government to back them up the most. And with even the Reserve Bank now projecting unemployment to reach 10 per cent in just a couple of months, it is a good thing, a very good thing, that Labor and the unions advocated for this wage subsidy program. Because right now, today, a third of people have lost their jobs in the hospitality sector alone. And there is no one in hospitality, be they hospitality workers or hospitality employers, who think that that sector is going to snap back any time soon. And there is no one in hospitality, be they workers or be they small businesses, who think that we can snap back the JobKeeper program in September or even earlier, as the ideologues on the Liberals' backbench are now arguing for. Uh, and there is no one in the hard-hit arts sector either that think that that sector can snap back straight away and that we can snap back JobKeeper programs in sectors that have been hard hit by this coronavirus crisis. It is going to take time and it is going to take a plan for these sectors to recover. And of course, having sectors like this continue to struggle is not just bad for the workers and for the businesses in those sectors, it is bad for the whole economy. An economy that was already struggling under the plans or lack thereof of this government. Uh, and this week, Deloitte Access Economics also warned against a snapback strategy. They highlighted how important it is for our recovery that there is ongoing support for workers, for vulnerable Australians and for the broader economy. 
They warned against the quick withdrawal of support programs like JobKeeper and also the Job Seeker program. Because if these programs were withdrawn overnight, we know that we will see hundreds of thousands of Australians moving on to Newstart, a payment that is so low that it actively impedes people's ability to find employment. So we have to ask today, is the government's plan to snap back to Newstart, the old Newstart rate of $40 a day, is that really the government's plan for workers in Australia today? And is that the plan for our country today? The government has the opportunity and they need to take a new approach. Their old approach, which they are desperate to snap back to, meant that we actually entered this crisis from a position of economic weakness, not one of strength. So let's not snap back to the lowest wage growth on record. Let's not snap back to an explosion of insecure jobs, of casual jobs, of gig jobs. And let's not snap back to our manufacturing jobs continually being offshored. And let's not snap back to sluggish and weak economic growth. Uh, and let's not snap back to unlivable social security payments. The Prime Minister told us when launching the JobKeeper program that we're all in this together. Well, right now, that couldn't be further from the truth. We are not. People are doing it tough. Millions are going without the support that they need already. And they need a government that will stay the course with them. They need hope for a better future. This government doesn't have a long-term plan for our recovery from this crisis. It didn't have a plan for growth and good jobs before this crisis. And if its only plan is to snap back now, then it doesn't have the plan for the future that all Australians need. Oh, thank you, Senator. The question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you. I take note of Minister Rustin's answers uh, to answers to the questions that I asked about the job seeker payment and whether the whether $40 a day for somebody on job seeker payment is uh, decent or fair. And it's quite answer, it's quite obvious that the government has in fact snapped back. They've snapped back to their old rhetoric that you can live on $40 a day because most people get other payments. The, the payment that most people get is the energy supplement. Wait for it, folks, a whole $8.80 a fortnight which is around, what, 65 cents a day. So for $41 a day, to be correct. Can people live on that? No, they can't. Is, is it decent and fair? No, it isn't. In answer to my question, which was about, well, will all those 1.4 million people who are currently now receiving job, keep, job seeker at that much higher rate, thank goodness, would they be employed in September? Well, quite obviously, the answer is no. No, the minister didn't actually say that because she wouldn't actually commit. She told us what the government might try and do to try and get people into work, which is all very well and good. But I'm sure the government knows just as well as we do on this side of the chamber that there is no way that on the 25th of September that all those 1.4 million, that's assuming that the government doesn't muck around with JobKeeper and more people fall out of employment and, and add to the growing list of the unemployed, that there's not more people there. But we will certainly have a large, large number of people, likely over a million people, still on the job seeker payment come the 25th of September. And what are those gonna, people going to do? Going to try and survive on $40 a day. And when I asked about whether the government intends taking that payment back to $40 a day. I didn't get a straight answer, but my assumption is yes, that's what they're going to do. Even though I'm not saying that's what the words that were in, that's what the minister said, but it was very obvious from the way the minister answered the question is the government wants to drop job seeker payment back to $40 a day. $40 a day is way below the poverty line way below the poverty line. So we know very well that people are living in poverty. And we know the government knows that. 
because they actually did increase job seeker payments. They did include a supplement. And oh, by the way, that supplement gets paid along with people's CRA, their, their rent assistance, along with the energy supplement, and along with the family tax benefit. So the people that were trying to survive on that $40 a day, plus, as the government keeps pointing out, some, some of them get some of those additional payments. They are a still living in poverty, and b they're still getting those with the supplement, as they should. I'm not arguing for a second that they shouldn't. What I'm arguing is that the government needs to acknowledge that we are not going to snap back in September, that people will still, a large number of Australians will still be trying to survive on a measly if it goes back to $40 a day, or $41 a day if you include the energy supplement on $41 a day. And the government knows you can't survive on that. They know you can't because they doubled the payment, quite rightly so, and I'm very pleased that they did. They saw that people weren't going to be able to survive. They saw when that up to, well, the prediction that we heard in the COVID inquiry uh, on the 30th of April was that the estimates the Treasury working on were 1.7 million Australians were likely to be, or potentially um, going to be, um, on job seeker payment come the end of September. So the government quite rightly, and we congratulated the government for making sure that people that were living on the job seeker payment could survive. But let's not pretend that even that supplement is anywhere near, because it's not the medium wage. So people are still, still harding it fine to make ends meet, even on that payment. But at least they're not living in poverty. They are living above the poverty line, which is what we should be seeing in this country. We don't want to see people living in poverty. We should not be dropping people down to 40 or $41 a day for those that are pedantic. We should be making sure we retain the rate. We need to be making sure that people are living with in decency and fairness, the government's own words, decency and fairness. Now, that's what our safety net should be providing, decency and fairness, so we need to retain the rate. We need to keep that payment, the job seeker payment and youth allowance with the extra supplement at the rates that they are at so that people aren't dropped back into poverty when they are trying to find work, making it even harder to find work, because it's been proved beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt that living in poverty is in Order, itself Senator a barrier Seawitt. to work. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes.